fantastic. We've got a good majority of people now who have joined us. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm Stacy Caldwell. I'm the CEO of the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, and we are so pleased that you have chosen to spend your afternoon with us. Um, if you're just joining us, we'd love to um, have you drop in the chat where you're dialing in from um, to just give us a sense of who's here. Uh, and our agenda today will be two parts. The first part, we're going to frame up the conversation for you and kind of, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, kind of um, explain where, where you've landed and, and um, what this is about. We'll actually break into um, a very brief breakout session so people have an opportunity to just kind of get to know a few of, a few of y'all um, the, on the chat or on the Zoom here. And then we're going to hear from our esteemed presenters that we're very excited um, to have today. Uh, and then we'll go into a Q&A and a discussion. So with that, and again, I just love seeing all the familiar faces. Um, thank you so much for being here. Let's get started. Um, so Tamia, I'm just going to make sure, are you in charge of the slides and I'm supposed to say next slide? Yes, please. Next slide. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here are the amazing humans that make up the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, both our board and our staff. And our mission is to connect people and opportunities to generate more resources to build a more caring, creative, and effective community. So we like to say we like to get smart people with good ideas, find the resources, and make great things happen for our region. Um, along with your traditional community foundation work that you might know uh, about, such as grant making, donor advised funds, building permanent endowments, um, we also have initiative work. Our initiatives really represent the issues that our community faces that are much bigger than any one organization can take on. And so the, those initiatives at TTCF include strengthening families, accelerating housing solutions, protecting our forests, which is how you've arrived here, and impact investing. Um, over the years, specific to our forest work, um, we have uh, had a nature fund that has actually made more than a million dollars in grants um, to a number of nonprofits in um, our community and throughout the region focused on forest projects and preserving our beautiful environment. So we've, we've been involved in environmental and recreation work as a grant maker for many years. Um, but more recently, um, we started to learn more and more about um, what was happening in our forest. It was apparent um, at first with the drought and the bark beetle and and then the catastrophic wildfires. And so we've been on a learning journey since April of 2018. I would even say before that. We started with what we called salons. And as you can see, many of our salons used to take place in a beautiful space across the street from our offices where we would really unpack a conversation with experts just like today. And we'd spend the evening together talking to those experts and really exploring the conversation typically over pizza, beer, and wine. Um, and so more recently, we've had to um, transition to this virtual realm of hosting our salons. And I got to say, it's been really refreshing. Um, in the space across the street, the maximum people we could hold was about 35 people. And um, today's uh, conversation uh, just continues to prove that there is more of an appetite, there's more of a demand for people to learn about what's happening. And so um, we're really excited to transition to this virtual realm because it makes more space for those who are interested. And so as you can see throughout the years, we've had a number of key players um, participate in these um, and oftentimes um, showing up many, many times over. And we're just so grateful that this network continues to build um, and learn from each other. And let's see, next slide. So what you're looking at here 
is an example of a healthy forest. It's the San Pedro Forest in Baja, California. It's never been logged and fire has not been suppressed on this landscape. Um, and what is unique about it is it is a very similar ecosystem to the Sierra Nevada. Um, what we know is when John Muir arrived, first arrived in the Sierra Nevada, he wrote about riding three horses wide. Um, oftentimes we say a healthy forest is a forest you can gallop a horse through. Um, but the point is there's space between these trees for sun and water to hit the earth and seep into the soil, um, filtering water for ground storage. This is really what a healthy forest looks like. Um, and the Sierra Nevada Conservancy estimates that more than 60% of our developed water supply of the state of California originates in the Sierra Nevada. So the health, the, the water is coming from these forests. Um, and so, and the other piece that you should know is that they hold, they are um, carbon dense um, and they're so dense it's higher than even rainforests. So this picture is where we are today with the Sierra Nevada forests. Um, they are dangerously overcrowded. They contain upwards of 129 million dead trees. Um, they are li literally tinder boxes waiting to explode. Um, so let's talk about how we got here. Um, so as we all know, we are experiencing changing weather patterns with more extreme weather. Um, we have decades of, of poor forest management and policy. Um, we have a lack of infrastructure that's been taken out of the system, um, resulting in, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, these are July numbers that we're looking at, which I, I would suspect have dramatically changed in the last month. 13.1 um, million acres of high hazard zone. 248 billion, excuse me, million bone dry tons. Um, and we're seeing as a result of this in insurance drops in California. And here we are today. Um, this is the worst season, fire season on record. Um, we've seen five of the largest fires in our history this year over 8,000 incidents, over 4 million acres burned, 9,000 structures, and 31 fatalities. And the season's not over yet. So to be clear, before I get into the role, if we can just go back, we are truly sitting in a place of privilege here in Tahoe. We get to talk about the future of our forests still. And we know that our neighbors throughout the state are not in the same place of privilege. And so I just want to acknowledge um, before we go any further in this conversation that many of you on this call have been impacted by these fires, either directly or indirectly. Um, many of you have been serving in some way to respond to these fires. Um, and we just want to let you know that we take this conversation seriously. We feel honored that you're spending your time with us to explore solutions. And we know that the region that we're sitting in is so worth protecting, as is all the other communities within California and the West. So just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that. Thank you, Tamia. Next slide. So our role at the Community Foundation is you know, first and foremost to convene, educate, and engage our stakeholders, but more importantly, our community. We, by nature of being a community foundation, mobilize resources. So I mentioned that we have our Nature Funds grants. Um, we've been working on a, a matching grant for this work that we're doing right now on the Forest Futures. I am proud to share and um, I believe the donors who facilitated this gift are actually on this call, but I can't see everybody in this mode. Um, but yesterday we received a $50,000 commitment towards the match. So the work continues. The donors continue to believe in this work. Um,
concept of a donor advisor. Hi there. 
if you are just joining the Forest Futures Salon, everybody is in a breakout room and we'll bring them back in about three more minutes. Would you like to join one or would you like to wait for everyone to join back into the main room? You're here. Do you mind unmuting yourself, David? I can go ahead and wait. Uh, are the speaker the speakers are coming on in a in a little bit later? Is that in about five 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 minutes after everybody is will be joining back into the main room? Then we'll introduce Tila and Robert. They'll introduce the speakers. So probably in the next ten minutes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I I was unfortunately on a on a long call, so I'm a little late. But that's fine. I just I was I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers. So. Uh, I'll just, should I just mute myself? Sure, yes. And like in two minutes, everybody will be back into the main room. I, I'll give them a one minute warning here in a few seconds. So thank you for joining us. Deb, okay. <laughs> Did everybody get their fill of pizza? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> my relationship to the forest is pretty intimate. I sleep in the forest every night. I don't sleep with it, but I sleep in it. And I get to see those trees when I wake up every morning right above my head. And every night I fall asleep looking at the stars. Um, and it is so personal, y'all. This is, this is so special and uh, spiritual. And um, they're the lungs of our planet and they're the keepers of our water and I know you're here because you all feel that way, even if you're not as wooey as I am. Wooey in a different way, though, too, right? Because we're wooey in WUI, but then, you know, there's the woo-woo, too, that you can be. All right, moving on. Um, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed that. Let's move on back to the PowerPoint. I think um, what you should know about the Community Foundation that didn't really get covered in that framework are two things. One is you know, we were founded by William Hewlett who recognized that there was an intrinsic need to bring more financial capital, particularly philanthropic capital to this region um, and who loved the forests and who loved the Sierra Nevada. Um, the other thing you should know that I didn't cover is you know, I shared with you that we've been grant makers for a long time. So, so what we don't want to do is replicate the work of our nonprofits. We really wanted to find um, a differentiator in our approach. 
We also know that the scientists and the policymakers that we host in these salons are doing great work. And the nonprofits um, and the foresters that do the projects in the forests are doing great work. But we actually believe that we need to accelerate the solutions and that maybe we can flip this challenge to be an opportunity for our region. And so that really took us down this pathway of thinking about market-based solutions for the forest. And this idea that we could identify businesses that were sustainable, sensitive to the environment and to you know, our social you know, and cultural assets as a community, but that could drive some innovation and some innovative thinking and business solutions accelerate these. And so that path led us to our two facilitators tonight. Um, Robert Suarez um, comes with an innovation um, and design and creativity background. Um, he hails from Singular University, um, Singularity University, as well as IDEO. Um, Teal comes by way of the Aspen Institute and um, other philanthropic organizations, and she brings um, to the table both kind of an academic brain and a policy brain. Um, and so the two of them with their innovation and business focus with this kind of deep understanding of the nuances of science and policy has been just an amazing pleasure to see unfold as we explore these topics, the Venture Lab, um, and all the work that is ahead of us. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand it off to our um, esteemed facilitators who will introduce our speakers and facilitate the rest of our conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks everyone for coming on this uh, Thursday afternoon. We're gonna, uh, I'll share a little bit. What we've done for the last several months was just really identify What's a strategy for not only TTCF, but you know, the broader community to identify current barriers that exist in, in the system to, to kind of accelerate market-based solutions uh, for our woody biomass. Because we know we need to get a market pull to fund the processing, fund the transport, fund the harvesting of the woody biomass and create a, a long-term sustainable ecosystem. So you'll see this, you know, we've had previous discussions around more focus on policy, um, some on the environmental science, but today is going to be a little different. Um, next slide, you'll see our team that's been kind of steering and guiding us, uh, folks nearby and you know, with great backgrounds, and I'm sure nearly everyone on this meeting. And then really just one next and last slide for me is just reminding us what we're doing here. Um, we're certainly about the you know workforce development and the health of our community, our homes where we live, you know, our insurance policies, but also this this notion of overall forest health. How does that land, ladder up to land stewardship in general? Um, always tying up and back and around to the carbon and climate equations of what we need to do. And you know, for the market-based solutions, have been pretty much focused on this waste of value. Um, how do we solve these challenges from a local place, but do it? do it uh, from a global perspective. So with that, I will hand it over to my friend Teal, who will walk us through what we're doing today. Excellent. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you, Stacy and Robert. Um, this is the moment we've all been waiting for, which is the folks that are gonna speak today and have a dynamic discussion you all came here for just to ground us a teeny tiny bit further in the topic at hand. Many of you have heard this number, but often quote number is the estimated cost of the restoration of the forest land we need to restore in the state of California alone is frequently quoted as about a billion dollars a year annually for about 10 years. And that's just to begin creating a safer, healthier environment. And it is also widely thought that that is not a tab the public sector can pick up on its own. And so that is where we bring in both the experts we have today and many of the issues folks on this call work on, which is how do we bring about private capital to help encourage landscape scale restoration? And today we have three really fantastic people joining us. 
as I'm speaking, Tamia is dropping their LinkedIn profiles in the chat. So you can go stalk them and connect with them directly. And I will just give us a brief introduction. We have a systems thinker focused on conservation finance a philanthropic fund manager focused on the innovative use of philanthropy to enable restoration, and an impact investor and forest land owner focused on putting capital to work within market-based approaches. And our conversation will take that trajectory between the three speakers. So Todd Gardner is the director of Cities for Forests and World Resource In Institute's National Infrastructure Initiative. Oh, look, and we're getting to see a picture of them. There we go. Todd has played a key role in several financial and economic analyses of nature-based solutions. I am guessing folks on this call have read some of those. And um, his background includes conservation incentives and ecosystems markets work with the American Forest Foundation, the USDA Forest Service, and several years as a corporate financial consultant. And Todd is also one of the people that I've met who is most adept at articulating extremely complex issues in a digestible way. So. Uh, thank you for playing that role today, Todd. Dan Winterson leads the Moore Foundation's program-related investment work for conservation outcomes and has written powerfully and valuably about investment in forest health. His prior work also includes time with McKinsey and Company and a term as Vice President for Teach for America, which I did not know until today. So that is a really, um, I think, lovely addition, especially reflected in your incredibly humble and um, positive demeanor in educating me in this space, Dan. And lastly, um, Chris Larson is the CEO and Vice President of New Island Capital. Chris directs New Island's portfolio and operations and has significant and specific depth of expertise in forest and farm investment. In past roles, Chris was involved in community-based watershed restoration in rural Northwestern California, so he has a particular place in his heart and his head for the landscape in which many of us are sitting up here in Truckee. So Todd, with that, we will just flow straight from speaker to speaker. And why don't you take us away? Right. Uh, you can hear me OK? Great. Perfect. Well, thanks, Teal. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Stacy, uh, for inviting me today and for organizing this panel. And congratulations on the $50,000 grant that you guys secured yesterday. That's, that's awesome. Um, and so I'm, I'm based out in Portland, Oregon, you know, west of the Cascades, an area that most people think of as, you know, wet and gray a lot of the time. And trust me, it, it, it too often is. But, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the skies were gray, but not with the, the classic sort of fog and mist, but with, with smoke. Um, so it's the second time in the last four years that a place that you know, we think about as being lush and green and, you know, environmentally friendly, et cetera, was, was bogged down um, in, just, in just heavy smoke um, and the worst air quality in the world. Uh, I used to live in New Delhi, India, um, and never thought that I would be in a place where the air quality was worse than that, let alone again in, in the Pacific Northwest. So I, I say that because obviously I know the conversation today is really focused on, you know, Truckee, Tahoe, Northern California, but um, you know this issue affects the entire West, even areas that we traditionally were thought were, were maybe safe uh, from from fire. And that challenge you mentioned, you know, ten billion dollars over the next ten years just to get started. You know, you know, fifty to sixty million acres across the West that are medium or high fire risk, um, and and you know that that's a daunting number, um, but. I do think, um, you know, silver lining type thinking that scale opens up some really interesting opportunities here. Uh, and because of, um, you know, how entrenched these images now are on people's, you know, in people's minds, uh, because of the, the human toll um, and, you know, people losing their house and unfortunately lives that we're seeing year after year, there is a window of opportunities to change the business as usual and to do things really differently. Um, and, and at the World Resources Institute, which is a, a global environmental organization, you know, we get to work from uh, Brazil to, to Madagascar to China and you know, in the, the forests of the West. You know, we really think about this 
uh, from an ecological standpoint, but also from a social standpoint, what does it mean for jobs and human health? And then what does it mean for, for economics and, and market? So what I hope to touch on over the next you know, five minutes is, is kind of highlighting those things, but then opening it up for, for, for broader conversation. Um, and, and really what my role is in this space is to figure out how to drive a heck of a lot more investment uh, into forest health treatments and so that we're spending the money upfront uh, in a strategic way instead of on the back end uh, for suppression and over time. And total respect. helping develop the, the Forest Resilience Bond, 15,000 acres in, in the Tahoe National Forest. We're now in, in year two of implementation there. And it's, it's a great example, right? Being able to drive upfront capital, both market rate investment and concessionary capital. I suspect Dan will probably talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then being able to make the case to those downstream of why they should be contributing towards the solution but giving them the benefit of being able to spread that cost out over time. The challenge is it's a great start, but we need 50 or even 500 forest resilience bonds across the West over the next 10 years. And we need each of them to be five to 10 times bigger, right? If we keep doing stuff at a small scale, we're gonna have small results. And you know, you're looking at six plus million acres that burned over the last three to four weeks. We've got to dramatically change our approach. So. So what are the roadblocks, right? I mean, none of this is new, I suspect, to most folks on the line. Why haven't we been able to see these ideas come to fruition? And, and it's not capital. Um, it's not capital, and we know this, not just because of you know, the reports that you know, many of you on the line have been a part of that show how much green-oriented green money is on the sideline, but because whenever there's a green investment that goes out to market, it's dramatically oversubscribed. So green bonds and things of that nature, we actually next week are launching the first certified green bond or under the, uh, under the climate bonds initiative, which goes towards forest land conservation and management. It's on the East Coast, but you're really starting to see the ability to tap into private markets for, for these types of issues. The capital is there, the interest is there. We're even starting to see at least in the European marketplace, a basis reduction, a basis point reduction uh, because of the oversubscription. So lower interest rates for utilities and other key beneficiaries uh, who can make this work. So if it's not capital, you know, what is it? And, and I've got a, a couple of thoughts that I'll, I'll lay out and uh, provide some ideas and hopefully that will set the stage for, for the rest of the conversation. Um, and this is all needs to be taken with the mindset of what we're doing now is a losing proposition. Right? We just need to accept that it, it doesn't work and it's proven every year. Um, so we've got to do things dramatically different. And to me, it starts with collaboration and communication. And our, our political divide right now in the country, you know, arguably has never been worse. And, and often that is sort of a, 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 you know, an urban rural divide as well. And fire and forest health is one of those unique issues that potentially can break that divider down, right? One of the reasons that we don't see larger treatments is because of the threat of litigation and because of the way that the environmental planning and review process work. I mean, there's so many low hanging fruits in terms of orchestrating more, um, more efficiency between the federal NEPA process and the state level CEQA process in terms of bringing in disparate parties early and often so that we're setting the stage for collaboration and reducing the likelihood of litigation on the back point and then providing the incentives for our federal land managers to go bigger. Again, the more we focus on 15,000 acres, the further we're gonna get behind that eight ball. And the larger we go in the scale of these treatments, the more appetizing these investments become to those in the capital marketplace, right? It's really tough to get folks excited about a few million dollar deal, right? The due diligence level that you need to take 
on a $5 million deal versus a hundred or $500 million deal is not dramatically different. It also allows you to show a real return on investment, right? If you take the landscape scale, you're much more easily able to show the scientific underpinnings of forced health treatments, the ecological results that will be accrued and what that remains to downstream hydroelectric facilities, irrigation districts, water supply entities. Um, if they contribute now to these types of programs, how there will be a return over the long run. And again, this money will be spent. It'll either be spent replacing the pipes and the turbines that have you know, been burned, burned out uh, or to invest in forest health treatments now. Um, the next thing is capacity, right? Well, that doesn't sound like an economics or a finance piece, but it really is. And again, it all fits into the scale piece. This summer, the senators where I live in Oregon, um, uh, Wyden and, and Merkley, put forward a new vision for um, basically the Civilian Conservation Corps, right? Coming out of the, the New Deal, you know, you know nearly a hundred years ago, um, we have scale and we have also record high unemployment in rural forested areas. If we merge those two things together, there is a ready-made solution. A restoration economy across our Western forests, you know, decent paying jobs, ways to move what we're doing in fire suppression into that forest health. If we get to that level of commitment, and some people think it's, it's a moonshot, but it's like, what other option is there? Uh, except taking these sort of bold steps. If we get to this level of scale, it automatically brings in the opportunity for complementary markets, you know, the biomass space uh, and the like. I know that's been a big conversation uh, here, here today. And, and, and the last piece that I would say, and, and I think it, it sort of, in some ways, sequentially goes down, is if you can orient all of these pieces, right? Jobs in the woods, much larger scale, complementary markets, landscape scale environmental planning, um, tapping into to, you know, real private capital, we then need to think about all of the different forms of dollars that are out there and how we do a much better job sequencing and leveraging them. Too often what I see, and I see it across the world, is what I refer to as random acts of conservation, right? Um, um, lots of smallish dollars going to disparate projects across the landscape that in and of themselves are beneficial but don't have the connectivity or the scale to really address the problems um, at the level that we need so we need to think about how philanthropic dollars leverage public dollars how we can tap into corporate dollars and those dollars i'm not talking about corporate social responsibility i'm talking about making the case to corporations of how these approaches benefit their bottom line and on many of these fortune 500 companies microsoft salesforce google they're creating science-based targets right now and there's going to be billions of dollars available but only if we can figure out how it fits into this this puzzle of of, of revenue streams and dollars so um i get excited about this i could go a lot further my, my last takeaway is none of this is rocket science um the science though not perfect is pretty clear the returns, though not totally predictable, are generally really positive. And if we get to scale, if we show the political will, and if we work together, I think we can get where we're going. And I believe that the, the Northern California community can really lead the way. So um, hopefully that did a decent job of setting up uh, Dan and Chris uh, to, to talk about, you know, what it really means to deploy capital in these spaces. And I look forward to the conversation to follow. So. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Todd, thank you. Dan, I think there are so many thoughts spinning in my head. Let's just go straight to you to reply. That's such a perfect segue about matching the right types of capital with the right types of opportunities. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Teal. And that was great, Todd. And uh, I'll try to resist the urge because I think you brought up so many um, good points and provocative points uh, that I want to touch on. Um, but before I just dive right into it, uh, just a quick introduction um, of the Moore Foundation. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Moore Foundation. For those of you that aren't, we're a pretty large foundation based down in Palo Alto, California. 
Um, our main focus areas are environmental conservation and science. And I think what's important to frame what I'm going to say is we have an approach um, where everything we do has to meet three filters. One, it has to be an important problem. Two, our funding has to have the ability to make a difference. And three, it has to be measurable. So those are our marching orders. Um, and we're organized around uh, specific initiatives or portfolios, each with their own theory of change, um, measurement system, and strategies. Uh, so that can kind of explain why I'm going to be approaching this problem the way I am. My own role, um, I manage our Bay Area Conservation Program that focuses on habitat and ecological health. And I also work in conservation finance across our, our conservation verticals. Um, so I think with that, maybe if you could show the slide um, that I had. So this is a slide um, that I put together. and um, what would be the right fit with the foundation. And I think every one of these potential interventions has merit. Um, what I was trying to do is figure, um, one, where can we have an impact with our funding? And two, what would be the right fit for the values and approach to the foundation? And not surprisingly, given that I'm talking to you today, where we came out or where I came out um, is kind of in that um, portion right to the left of the flame, which is large scale forest restoration and then forest stewardship for fire management, where we really can have a meaningful impact. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I leave this slide, I think there are a couple other areas that are interesting here um, and that we have not given up on by any means. Um, one is detection and suppression. Um, some of you may have seen uh, the foundation working on this, which may be a little confusing. And that's because it's a personal interest of our president. So he has hosted a couple workshops and I think made some uh, exploratory grants out of his president's fund. And there are some promising technologies here. I'm certainly not an expert on those, but that is something that I think he's gonna continue to look at and see if there, if there are ways that we might be able to engage there. Um, the last area before I move on to the main course is, uh, is insurance payout and policies. And I think this is just an intriguing but very early concept, um, given that, you know, theoretically at least, um, treating forests, healthy forests, should reduce uh, catastrophic fire risk and therefore um, be a major financial positive for insurance companies. So is there a financial mechanism there where you can um, you can cover the cost of these treatments and maybe a little extra um, through uh, the insurance mechanism? And can you adjust uh, either insurance rates or discounts based on the way forests are managed and treated? And there are a host of um, difficult problems to solve here, uh, primarily around insurance regulation and what whether insurance companies, uh, what they can use to set rates. But there are, we do have some partners who are looking at this and I, I think it's a promising area providing, planning to provide some seed funding in this area and it's something I wanna pay attention to. Um, but I think, you know, the area that we're, we're most engaged now that I've most engaged in um, is that forest management. So we can probably take this slide off at this point. Um, so looking at a problem like this, and I should probably caveat everything by saying this is a, a pretty wicked problem. It's really uh, many different problems rolled into one, the wildfire problem. So I'm not trying to present that, uh, that neither I nor the foundation have the answers to this. Um, but I think with any of these problems, it helps to break it down and then frame the problem. And one way to do that is looking at forest because I think depending on um, who owns it, um, that really leads you into what are the solutions available. And they're very different depending on the ownership structure. And I think we are um, fortunate in terms of um, simplicity of solution that most or a, a little over half of California's forests are 
um, owned by the U.S. Forest Service. And I think this presents an opportunity um, that you don't have on some more fragmented forests. So I think, and this is where I'll kind of riff on what, what Todd was saying a little bit, um, you know, I, because I agree with everyone that we can't just sit back and let uh, the, the federal government or the state government handle this problem. Um, and that's not going to happen anytime soon. But I do think there are positive, there's positive movement here. I think you saw the announcement probably a couple months ago um, with the agreement for shared stewardship of California forests and rangeland, the partnership between um, the Forest Service and uh, California. And I think if you can get uh, the current federal government regime and California's current regime working together, that really does get to what Todd said is uh, kind of bridging the political divide around this topic. And they did agree, I believe, to treat uh, each uh, 500,000 acres a year um, with mechanical thinning and prescribed burning. So that's a million acres a year. That's meaningful. Um, and again, I'm not saying problem solved, let's, let's all go home, but I don't think we should discount that too, because if, you know, if let's say they own 58% of, of the forest and 19 million acres, if they're treating a million a year with public funding, that's really a positive step, but it doesn't address everything. And that's where, as Todd alluded to, uh, the forest resilience bond comes in and really is an excellent tool for, um, for addressing uh, restoration at scale on U.S. Forest Service land. And that is a limitation of the FRB. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of the FRB. I've invested in it um, both with contributions, grant funding, and uh, program-related investments. And I have a lot of hope that that will continue to progress and scale and that we can invest in, in future uh, issuances of the Forest Resilience Bond. And I think most people here know about the FRB, um, I, but what, I'll just give a quick overview and that the model um, involves raising capital upfront from investors, whether philanthropic or um, commercial investors, to finance forest restoration um, in partnership with the U.S. Forest Service and, and, uh, and the National Forest Foundation. Um, this money then is repaid um, over time from the beneficiaries of that restoration work. And that's U.S. Forest Service, that's the state of California in this case, and local water agencies. Um, so it's a pretty simple in some ways, it's a simple in concept, very difficult to achieve, as uh, Todd can tell you and Zach from Blue Forest can tell you, but they've done amazing work in actually putting that partnership together, structuring it, and making it work, um, at least in one pilot so far, and we hope many more to come. I think what what I've been impressed with too, let me just give one plug for the FRB, and where I think the innovative component comes in, is that they've been willing to adapt their model in a way that I don't often see. They started very much as a for-profit enterprise, um, set themselves up as an LLC, gonna have a pay per performance component to their work. And they've transitioned really seamlessly, I think, into a nonprofit model um, with fixed contracts up front, which I think is much more appropriate um, for the type of work they're doing. But I think that really hopefully will allow them to grow. So, uh, again, I, I, I think I could talk about that. Todd could talk about it probably for even longer than I can. But it's a really it's a great model because it can scale. Um, it's just the, the hard work of setting up the individual partnerships. So that's kind of the, the federally owned U.S. Forest Service land. And again, I'm not trying to say oh, we have that totally covered, but you see that it is being addressed and there's a path to scale both through the public funding and um, approaches like the Forest Resilience Bond. The next category of forest I would call, this is kind of a, a little bit of a mishmash, but it's it, forests that are owned by partners who are capable of stewardship um, at a meaningful scale. So this would include state parks, county parks, uh, timber companies, water agencies, municipal parks, and, and increasingly NGOs. Um, because state parks is not accepting new land, it hasn't been for some time, more of our NGO partners are not only um, buying uh, property, but they're holding it for the long term. They plan to hold it indefinitely in some cases. Um, and these are all organizations that we can partner with. So what can we do here? What have we done here? Um, a lot of these partners uh, 
already have a what I would consider you know a cutting edge approach to how they steward their land um, and in particular fire smart stewardship so just helping them acquire the land and get the land into their hands is one big important step there are others where we can make select investments to either incentivize or to build capacity in how they steward their land I'll give one quick example of this um, and that's Sonoma County Regional Parks, which owns thousands of acres of forest um, up in uh, Sonoma County, as you may guess by the name. And historically, uh, their mandate has been public access, public recreation, and they haven't thought so much about the ecological health of the forest. But about five years ago, we had the opportunity to provide some seed funding, which allowed them to hire their first ever uh, natural resources director. Um, so we provided funding for that position for, I think, a year and a half, um, as well as some funding uh, for consultants. And they were able to hire a wonderful woman named Melanie Parker, who really changed their approach and is now deputy director of Sonoma County Parks. And I think now, um, if you look at how they manage their forests, it's drastically different than before that. And that until just a really a, a small, one of the smallest grants I've ever made. Um, but that's leveraged then to, to thousands of forested acres. And then um, I'll move to the third category of forest, and this is obviously the hardest one. That's a, the private landowners, the family forests. How do you do anything at scale um, to help to help those to, to move that towards forest health and uh, fire smart stewardship? Um, and here it's tricky. I don't have the answers. I think our most effective uh, intervention, and people may not call this innovative. I probably would, but it, because it has been so effective, is if you can change the ownership, if you can take that land and say, all right, it was um, privately owned, there is no forest management or minimal forest management, and put it in the hands of an organization that's going to actively steward it for forest health, that's a huge delta, and that's really important. Um, and, and I think it's a huge delta for a couple reasons. One is it stops development. So if you protect this land, move it into park status, you are not going to be building houses on the uh, wildland urban interface, right? So, which I think is one of the major drivers of why we call wildfires a problem because they're burning these structures and as well, we should call it a problem. Um, and the other thing is, like I said, you're changing the way the forests are managed. Um, if you move from uh, a landowner that has no interest in managing their forest to one of our, our partners who are cutting edge. It makes a big difference. So that that's one, yeah, I think in some ways our core approach. Um, it is difficult to do at scale. I think we've achieved a reasonable scale, but you can't buy everything. And if you can't buy it, there are, I, I think there are two approaches that we are continuing to pursue, but still are early stage here. They both, the entry point for both is carbon when you're working with private um, small landowners. Um, we're trying to help uh, Semper Virens Fund set up a carbon aggregation bank where you can essentially um, count multiple small forests as one big forest and kind of hit the, hit the hurdle for scale in order to have a implementable carbon project. And another partner here, I think that is really great thinking is the American Forest Foundation and their uh, family forest carbon program, as well as some of their other uh, engagement with uh, small family forests. Um, so I'll probably pause there. That's kind of, that pretty much sums up our approach on, on those different segments. And thank you. Um, you structured your comments in terms of bifurcating your response by land ownership and land ownership structure, which is a good transition to Chris, um, who owns forest land. <laughs> that is um, only a very small piece, Chris, I know of your approach to forest health. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think about these issues from an impact investment standpoint? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, maybe I'll just first start by saying I'm really excited to be here. I think um, community communities and community stakeholders talking about the future of their forests is something that's really near and dear to my heart. And I think it, you know, in a time in in these challenging times, it's affirming, it's constructive, and it's hopeful. And I also think that the one thing that communities can bring that is really unique and kind of totally 
unusual in these days is the the consistency and persistence uh and and kind of you know sort of like the uh you know water dripping for a long period of time in one place you know even though communities may not have a lot of power or agency the durability of vision and kind of working over decades as a community group can do things that are that nobody else can do and so i just want to really commend you guys for getting getting this started and and hopefully that that this effort persists over over generations because that's what this will require um and and my kind of connection to that really was um uh, as, as you alluded to, Teal, my early work doing watershed restoration work up on the north coast of California along the, the Lost Coast and the Matoll River Valley. And, and we actually wrote one of the first um, community fire safe plans and set up a fire safe council back in 2001, 2002. And a lot of the thinking back then was this idea like we need to help rural landowners back to the land, you know, people 40 acre parcels do defensible space. And if we can do defensible space and water storage and coordinate gate access and stuff, everything's going to be fine. This is going to take get under control. And the last 20 years have really shown that that is not true. And I think to Todd, some of Todd's points that really this does, these these fires, you know, I think one of the things we've seen here in Sonoma County with the, the fires this summer is that even people who have done that stuff to the hill, um, it has it has uh, minimal effect if you have a wall of fire and convective, uh, you know, fire behavior kind of roaring at you at, you know, 60 miles an hour. And so it does really call for this landscape scale approach. Landscape scale approach is very expensive. It's something that doesn't seem like currently to date we've had the political will to spend those billions of dollars. I do at the end of the day think that unfortunately for better or worse, this is going to be a mix of public and private money coming together to figure out how this this will work. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is the prospect of how private capital could play a role in the solution. Um, and I think it's a tricky one. I think it is, um, you know, it's it's tricky to, you know, when public money is used for private goods, that's generally called corruption. When private money is used for public goods, you know, sometimes we call that impact investing, but there's not a lot of cases of, of that taking place. And so a lot of times the reality is that there's going to be partnerships where dollars come into a project together. Um, and I think in the nature of biomass utilization and particularly the idea of thinning dead trees, thinning small diameter trees, the reason that's not happening right now is it's not economic as a private, purely private activity. And so we do need to figure out how these two things come together. And just as a thought exercise here right now, the annual kind of cash revenues um, from the forest products industry in California, about a billion, billion three to billion four per year in California. So that's kind of the natural state of what's profitable to take out of the forest, whether that's the SPIs or the small family landowners or the Redwood timber companies. So everything that we do kind of needs to expand that to some degree to figure out how to take this non-economic material out of the woods. Non-economic material is stuff that's too small, too dead, too steep, too far away, too far away from a mill, uh, non-commercial species, all of that stuff. So we need to figure out how do we pull this industry to kind of take advantage of and start um, start using some of those resources. And it's challenging. And I speak as somebody who's uh, made six or seven you know, small investments ranging from a quarter million to maybe two or three million dollars into companies that are trying to address and kind of attach onto the perimeter of this, whether it's small diameter biomass utilization, firewood, the so-called integrated wood campus model that I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and these projects the, ch the commonality of, ch of challenges, I guess I'd say, maybe to start off before I pivot to something more hopeful here, is that number one, they're capital intensive. Bulldozers, equipment, logging equipment, you know, lo a, a state of the art logging uh, contractor today needs a million dollars just to get into business in California, right? So that's why it's all old uh, guys and their sons, right? Uh, so it's difficult to get into. Biomass utilization equipment is expensive. Um, the, there's so many economies of scale. You know, one thing I learned recently that I found really interesting was that uh, along the West Coast, just from a sawmill production standpoint, the most efficient sawmills in California, Oregon, and Washington are eightfold more efficient than the least efficient sawmills that are still in business. And you'd think the inefficient ones would have gone, out, mostly have gone out of business already, but there's a huge delta in kind of how efficient milling operations can be. So whether it's handling biomass for post and pole or firewood or bioenergy or saw logs or making CLT products, there's a lot of economies of scale that favor large production, which is not something that maybe we like to think about on a community scale, but it is, it is just a fact of how these 
bulky, heavy, low value materials have to be processed and handled. Um, there's cyclicality, right? Lumber markets and, and biomass markets go up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, you know, two by four used to cost two and a half dollars uh, as recently as a year and a half ago. Now it costs six dollars and probably in a year from now it'll be two dollars. So trying to get loans and financing when your end products are so unpredictable is historically a very, very challenging uh, thing. Uh, and then you have the challenge that the Forest Service is not easy to work with from a procurement and feedstock and contracting perspective. And so the, the California forest products industry and even those that are trying to experiment with biomass utilization really predominantly have to be working with private land and, and, and maybe some of the more progressive kind of state or, or rather uh, county level jurisdictions that, are, that don't have the cumbersome uh, procurement and litigation risk that the Forest Service has. I mean, even the BLM is significantly easier to work with uh, on that front. So again, it's very hard to figure out how do you get financing for a business where you have all those different factors in place. Um, so that's that's challenging. Um, and then on the bioenergy side of things, you know, the reality is is that um, you know five years ago, ten years ago, biomass was uh, in many cases a more a cheaper source of green energy than solar and now it is not and solar is much cheaper and so there's some kind of raw economics that have been kicked out from under the the energy opportunity and those have been you know so we, we need to think about bioenergy as something that needs to fundamentally be subsidized because it is producing these forest health co-benefits um, so those are those are my sober warnings and and concerns about the investment space. Um, our our track record investing in this, frankly, has been mixed. I think the biggest differentiator, frankly, has been the quality and tenaciousness of the entrepreneur and luck. Um, some of the best entrepreneurs we've worked with have had their facilities catch on fire and burn down. Uh, others have have been, uh, you, you know, gotten into unfortunate supply chain, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, contracting disputes, things like that. But nonetheless, kind of entrepreneur quality is like a really central part of, of um, whether these things are, are make or break. Um, Investor, what do investors want? That's a question I get asked all the time. What kind of return do you want? What are you looking for? Um, and the reality of that question, I'll just answer in the broadest sense, is that investors want to be paid for the risk that they're taking. The investor that is investing in a startup, you know, biomass enterprise that has a lot of complexity and a lot of risk around how it's going to sell and where it can procure wood is probably going to demand sort of a venture capital type return and take a lot of the upside of that opportunity from the entrepreneur. Uh, in contrast, a stable, mature business that has a very consistent quality of earnings, meaning that it has got a very consistent cost for its raw materials, production cost, and, uh, and kind of sales profile, could go and get very cheap uh, sources of financing potentially from a bank. And so there's this big spectrum. And so as an entrepreneur or a community group that's trying to start a project, one of the things that you just need to have a laser focus on is how do I de-risk as many aspects of this project to make it as stable and steady as possible? And that is not necessarily an easy, easy feat, but I would say at least the amount of public policy interest uh, and community interest in this allows at least for there to be some public subsidies, loan guarantees, things of that that can cause kind of de-risk the project and make it uh, a little bit expensive. Um, so in that context, what investors, at least with cheaper sources of capital like lenders are looking for, uh, are really high quality entrepreneurs and, and management that know what they're doing, uh, steady and stable returns with you know modest growth prospects, uh, and then that the operation be relatively simple to understand. Uh, and then finally, I think, you know, some degree of social license, which I think I'll get to in a second here, I think is, is somewhat of a challenge in, uh, in some forested communities in California more than, than others. And I think there's a potentially an inverse relationship between um, wealth and second homeowners and, and things like that and social license to do uh, commercial forms of forestry, even if they're really focused on bio, uh, on, on forest health. <clears throat> so with all of that said, you know, I think the things that we're excited about in this space are um, just there's A, there's so much focus and attention on this right now that talented people from all sorts of other uh, walks of life and you know, the best business school students coming out of our universities, people coming from kind of more of a, um, an entrepreneurship, design, tech uh, perspective are flooding into the space. So there's a huge rush of talent that wants to get into this in a way that there wasn't even five or 10 years ago. So that's really exciting. It's a raw, huge raw ingredient 
it right, right from the beginning. Second one is that there are more and more examples around the West of things that are working either modestly or, or maybe even successfully. And one of the things that we're really excited about and have been made a few investments in are this is this idea of an integrated wood campus. This idea that you bring a lot of material to one place and then you can sort it out for its highest and best use. So a facility that has Yes, energy, but energy is really at the bottom rung uh, in terms of value. You've got firewood, you've got post and pole, you've got saw logs, maybe you've got some other value added stuff going on. And all that stuff's happening in one place. There's lo some logistics economies of scale there, and then also some product diversification so that income can be more diversified, that sort of a thing. So those are those, that's an idea that we think is really <clears throat> um, very compelling and we're seeing um, really take off in, in Oregon. Uh, as well as in Eastern Washington, which have similar challenges to to where where we are, um, and then I think you know I think the other one that's exciting is just that that there is a more and more supportive policy environment in California. There's more funding, there's more incentives, there's things like the SB 1122 program that providing feed in tariffs for small scale uh, bioenergy projects, and then there's more and more technology the technology around some of these things that kind of a pipe dream five years ago are really coming into play. Things like bio conversion of cellulosic fuels into bioethanol. That was something that was, you know, kind of a forever about to emerge sort of a thing. And now there's big technology providers, uh, particularly coming out of Europe that are offering stable technologies with real performance guarantees backed up by real balance sheets. So that's, that is, that could be a real game changer. Um, I think one of the things that I would be really hopeful about and, uh, in, 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 in such an iconic region as the Tahoe region is the opportunity to connect with local consumers that are have some degree of affluence around products that represent stewardship of place. Uh, that's a, simply an opportunity that's unavailable to 90% of the Western United States that you guys have that could drive maybe some modest premiums around around particularly value add products that could come out of something like an integrated wood campus. So that's, that's a really cool idea. Um, you know, I think I'll end with by saying something that might be really unpopular for most of you, and that is, um, I think at the end of the day, one of the funding streams that we really have to look at here is homeowners. And um, I think we are coming to a day of reckoning, if not this year, five years, but probably at least 10 years away, where folks that have made their homes in wildland urban interfaces, and I count myself as one of those people, are going to have to shoulder more of the burden for this. If that choice is no insurance and therefore no mortgage, or invest in this on a landscape scale, I just really feel that that's going to crack at some point. The problem is not acres burned, right? So the, the August fire, our first mega fire in California, it's burned over a million acres, has only burned down a hundred homes. In contrast, we have fires in Sonoma County that are 40 to 50,000 acres that burned down thousands of homes like the 2017 Cubs fire. So there's a disconnect between acres and homes and structures and stuff that I think there's gonna be some reckoning around. And so I do think in the future, there might be some something to think about, kind of, and I don't want to I don't want to point at blue forest here, but a forest restoration bond 2.0 that involves homeowner and homeowner value that is going to come into focus, uh, particularly in areas where housing prices are so high. So I'll leave with that deeply unpopular thought uh, and pass it back to Teal. I love that you went from your, as you call them, somber. Uh, somber data points into your hopeful, but then you just you really wrapped us right back up with them. Um, with with some fear <laughs> so uh, to me i see that you have your hand raised oh no that's clapping excellent okay sorry about that um thank you each so much i think that we are going to have a lot of questions and discussion from people who are here listening as you listen in if there are questions that are already burning please either drop those in the chat or send those to robert and myself directly and we will um, call on you and make sure that those those questions are asked. There was discussion, um, Chris, in the in your comments. You spoke about the increasingly um, uh, growth of positive support from policy in the state of California in a variety of different ways. I'd be interested to ask each of the panelists about your perspectives on policy on the horizon that would be catalytic for the type of capital that you are trying to move. And that could be a question about carbon markets and carbon pricing, but it could also be a question about incentives and other types of subsidies. I'd love to hear if you have perspectives um, around that landscape and what's on the horizon. I, I offered that question sort of generally, so if any of the three of you uh, wanna jump in, you're welcome to. 
I, I think I'm going to defer to Dan and Todd. They're much more close to the policy arena than, than I am. I could talk about characteristics of policy that might incent private landowners, but that we're not we're not a policy shop. Dan, I see you speaking, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Great. I said I was going to defer to, to Chris, actually, on this, but he beat <laughs> me to the punch. Um, we don't really focus on policy either. I do think um, certainly uh, you see policy like uh, the cap and trade uh, resources being used to fund forest health. You see the Great American Outdoors Act. Both of these really have um, have really helped fund this effort. So I think those are those are two big wins and um, and more policy like that. I think also um, you see different state bonds that have passed and failed, but the more funding. Um, that or that like the wildlife conservation board or the coastal conservancy can have through their various programs um for both acquisition i talked about the importance of acquisition of forested land and also stewardship i mean those are those are kind of direct policy actions todd might have a better view on some of the enabling enabling ones but those make a huge difference and you see those uh like wcb being when they have funding they're a tremendous partner and we could do a lot more than, than when they don't yeah um, I don't know if it's fully policy, but it may be a shift in approach a little bit. Um, one, I'll, I'll say a challenge that we ran into. So Blue Forest Team and, and WRI, along with the American Forest Foundation, um, along the Front Range in, Calif in, sorry, in Colorado, um, looked to apply an FRB-like approach on private lands. And there were a lot of lessons learned. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges with aggregating small landowners. And, and really what we concluded, which, you know, it's not... Um, not super surprising is if you can have an, you know, what we call an anchor tenant of, of public land, it becomes uh, then a lot easier to think about whether it's in holdings or private land sort of on the adjacency, sort of building them in to a structured deal. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. And you hear, I'm not taking a swipe at the Forest Service because I know it's really challenging. There's a lot of conversations around an all lands approach. Uh, and I think that we need to figure out as a community what that means in in in, um, in terms of action so not just forest service land but department of interior lands state lands utility lands industrial timber lands and 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 what we call non-industrial which is you know below a thousand acres clearly it adds some complexity but the landscape is the mosaic is what it is and so we need to treat it as such and our funding pools are too siloed and our planning and environmental review processes are too siloed. So um, I think we need to figure out how to how to overcome that because fire doesn't care about, you know, where the boundary line starts and stops. Thanks, yeah, Todd. I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I would echo that. Yeah, I mean, obviously working on a landscape scale is, is critical. And again, that's where that community lens really comes in, into play, right? The more private landowners are bought into a community vision, the more you can through persistence and long-term dialogue, pull in the federal land managers. I mean, that's that's how it happens and, and can happen and, and does happen in collaborative uh, working groups all across the West. In terms of kind of subsidies and, and policies, I'd say a couple of things. One, one thing is that the, the subsidy and policy has to be relatively flexible and meet the market where it's at. And, and I, I did mention the SB 1122 program, so just it's kind of an obscure thing, but this is a um, incentive that was put out, basically a feed-in tariff for small-scale bioenergy projects that would connect to the grid. So if it's under three megawatts, you can build one of these things. A lot of people are trying to build them in the Sierra and on the North Coast. And, and one of the big challenges there is that they basically said, okay, PG&E and other investor-owned utilities, you have to buy power at this like, you know, really attractive price. And that, that was it. And basically they left all the contracting to PG&E. And so PG&E is like, well, we don't want to buy power at this really expensive price. We're going to make this as difficult as it possibly can be for uh, for community entrepreneurs to actually participate in this program. All this r risk and co complexity around interconnects, all this uh, performance, you know, like we, we looked at seriously doing an SB 1122 project on some of the land uh, we steward up in Humboldt County. And one of the things we read in the fine print was basically like, if your power system goes off for some you know, ridiculously short period of time, like 96 hours or something that they can cancel the contract. And if you're predicating that contract on getting this 15 or 20 year high electricity price, and that's what you're financing, 
and you know a storm can take you out and they can break the contract around that that's a complete non-starter for a private investor to, to get involved in something like that so in contrast all the big biomass plants around the north state basically got in you know rather than something where they're trying to um you know jam uh pg e with high price power they got this biomass subsidy 20 dollars per ton or whatever the biomass program i have a lot of criticisms about who was able eligible for that and not eligible for it and the market distortions that was created but it's certainly been a lot more usable for those at legacy biomass facilities to to remain economically viable in the course of something like that. So, um, you know, uh, biomass incentives could be a way to do things uh, or more flexible uh, programs, like something like SB 1122, but more flexible. Uh, finally, on the land management side, I'll put in a plug for, um, you know, WCB and conservation easements to riff off of what Dan said, and, and this again from the land management perspective. So one of the things in forestry in California that is vexing and one of the things about forestry that's vexing in general is um, that you know, privately managed intensively managed forests are generally on this kind of like 30 to 40 year harvest rotation and so we have this landscape that is capable of growing 500 and thousand year old trees that are really uh, the kind of resilient ecosystem that you you started in the, the uh, Baja example which I've been to that park it's really cool uh, and um, we just aren't growing that because in timber companies want to cut the tree as soon as it's commercially viable conservation easements are a way to bridge that where you can say okay timber company you're going to sell an easement in benefit of the state and it's going to have real mitigation measures around growing trees to 70 years or 80 years where you can start getting some of that structural complexity that um, might slow down fires certainly would provide habitat for a diverse set of species that kind of a thing that's not something we can do on millions and millions of acres of private forest land but certainly you know around the tahoe rim around sonoma county around kind of high value forests um, that's a that could be a way to stretch acquisition dollars so instead of acquiring land turning it into public land and then and then the public has to manage it into perpetuity. Private landowners still manage it, but now under a much more fire and habitat friendly regime that's imposed by that conservation easement in perpetuity. So I wanna just put a plug that that's something that is is happening in a big way. Um, we, you know, Our forest land in Humboldt County is in a landscape uh, when we started with none of that, and now we're part of a quarter, quarter million acre contiguous block of land that's protected in that format. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Um... I wanted to kind of follow that thread on the community engagement and involvement. Uh, one on, I know the attitudes that Emily's asking, but really we talked a lot and we ha all have probably all talked a lot about the campus model, the idea of a campus, you know, I think, and it's tough for me to find someone who doesn't disagree conceptually, regardless of distribution or centralization, you know, all those other things. I, I know Maria was talking about co-ops, I look around all of us, especially for the three of you, what what do you see as the big barriers for those to exist? Why aren't we on campus right now talking about this? Chris, I know you mentioned it as one of your solution areas, so I'm going to point to you first. <laughs> Entrepreneurship, I think. I mean, I think we need, you know, these things don't just materialize. I don't, personally, this may be an unpopular view. I don't think that nonprofit organizations are necessarily well suited to bring these things into being. I think it does require somebody spearheading it, taking the risk, putting uh, their efforts into it to make it happen. I think once that person gets some traction, there's going to be a lot of people that want to follow, but I do think it does require that. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of resources can be put behind that person, but fundamentally uh, them or a small partnership of, of people who are taking the risk and are going to get the upside of it. And sorry to sound like a capitalist, but I, those all the success, successful examples that we've seen around the West generally revolve around that. How much is, I mean, this is, how much of the challenges though have been the lack of, of guaranteed contracts, right? I mean, they're just yep. clear. I mean, it's like you are talking, whether it's equipment or, or the infrastructure here, I mean, you need a decade plus of guaranteed flow um, yeah. to make a front investment. And because of the system we have, small scale, disparate approaches, it, it, it's a big risk. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think the sweet spot probably is to figure out a partnership with a private landowner. And, you know, even that in California is risky because our timber regulatory system is pretty challenging to even secure private, you know, flows of wood from private lands. But I think having a private landowner supply agreement is probably a starting point that then you could build on 
opportunistically getting stewardship contracts or bidding on timber sales or that sort of a thing outside of it. I think even working with the BLM might be a, a leg up relative to the Forest Service. Um, so that's, I guess, what I would what I would offer on, on that front. And there, you know, there are private landowners that are hungry to have fuels reduction and biomass reduction done on their property. I don't think that that would be that rare to find. I think the challenge is, are those private landowners willing to spend fifty, sixty thousand dollars per timber harvest plan to get the wood fire and the Board of Forestry have put out this series of um, fuels reduction exemptions. I think they've got up to four or five different permutations of it right now. None of them have ever actually been used because clearly they're not um, uh, they're not attractive enough economically for anyone to pull the trigger on them. So I still think there's some work to be done on the state private forestry regulatory framework where we can both protect forests and also make that low, small to medium diameter wood product available without the, the upfront cost of, of uh, THPs and heavy environmental analysis. Because we see, we see this activity happening with a mosaic of private and federal landowners in Oregon and in Washington, but we do not see it in California. In preparing for this panel discussion, I had a conversation with Todd in which we talked a little bit about the scale at which NEPA permitting and other permitting structures take place and the opportunities that may or may not exist to increase the scale of permitting. We talked a lot about that on our last salon to a scale that might be more relevant for supply predictability to enable investments to have a lower risk, to have a more credit worthy supply line, um, particularly, and, and this was pointed out by Emily in our chat, uh, particularly in areas that are dominated by federal land. So it's interesting um, with that in mind to hear the three of your approaches as sort of trying to work around, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, um, the reality of current permitting structures rather than engaging with, and I don't know how this would be done, <laughs> engaging with changing that as part of your strategies. And I'm curious if you have a thought as to the opportunities that may or may not exist to increase uh, land scale scape permitting or land scale, excuse me, landscape scale restoration projects such that you would have a greater supply predictability, Chris, to your point just now. Is this something that any of the three of you are thinking about or working on directly? Um, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of conversation. Um, um, the Nature Conservancy in California has really been a leader in this space trying to push for much larger landscape scale permitting and, and, and review processes. Um, uh, at this point, I think there's just a pause until we see what happens on, what is it, November 3rd? Um, um, and, and then hopefully this issue can be can be, be revitalized. But people are giving you a lot of football. This was talking about, you know, you need that entrepreneurial spirit on to have you need advocates and champions within the public agencies to, to do things differently. And there's no magic wand. When you look at the one of the primary reasons that the, the Forest Resilience Bond was successful uh, in the North U watershed was because of Forest Service leadership at the at the, uh, the supervisor level and at the district ranger level, uh, as well as leadership in the utilities. Um, Yes, we did the analysis. You know, yes, we worked through you know all of the due diligence, but we we could do that because we had leaders willing to take a risk and do something different and new, and they saw the incentives of success being much greater than the potential of of not delivering. Um, and, and I think that just speaks to some of the incentives that we need to look at within our federal agencies that really are not just going to focus on hitting the numbers um, from areas that aren't as high of a priority to drive our forest health treatments um, where they're needed most. Um, easier said than done, but I don't know what an alternative is. Thanks, Todd. Um, there are a lot of questions coming to us. so. 
I think with that, I've, I've referenced a couple that I received privately in the, in the questions I just asked, um, but I think we'll open it more um, broadly to many questions we're seeing here. And why don't we start, unless Robert, you wanna take us in a different direction. No, let's go. Where are you going? Does that work with uh, Lauren Fletcher's question, I'm thinking, um, which she has put in the chat here. Um, Lauren, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, geez, Todd, I'm just up in White Salmon, and I had the uh, the worst of the of the of the smoke just centered right here at a really horrible spot. I'd love to catch up with you because I got so many questions on economics, and we're so close. I would easily ra happily buy a, a socially acceptable distant uh, beer, coffee, or lunch. So let's let's chat offline. Um, my immediate question right now is is that if there's that much burned out land across California, which we know there is and most of that real value is left to the landowners certainly those who are foresters and they're not going to see any sort of upside not the large scale landowners but the larger the, the smaller scale landowners and there's no value left in it except replanting in you know 25 30 years from now do you think that they'll start looking to dump that property uh and if so is that a, a fire sale pun intended is it an opportunity because it that you know if this types of organizations are looking for land to be able to these types do these types of projects at a yep. good value then now's the time it would seem and if that's a, a real opportunity or not go ahead sorry was someone else going to jump in there please please do it yeah, yeah. I, I could jump in because i think you're absolutely right it is an opportunity we've seen that um we've seen a lot more properties come on the market we've seen um you know a lot of, if, if timber is a major component of um the, the appraisal we've seen uh, value is going down. So it's a huge opportunity for everyone involved in uh, conservation acquisition um, at this point. And I think some some of the um, properties that we've been looking at for a long time now as a result of these fires are doable. Um, so I think it's a great point, Lon. And And it's, I mean, each, each, each fire, each property is going to be different, but um, there's a lot of difference of opinions on the ecological value and I guess morality of salvage logging, right? But in, in a lot of these places, there still is a lot of value to be had while we can still leave enough, you know, standing dead wood and snags for, for the habitat and biodiversity. So um, there potentially is some, some, still, some revenue streams there. And in ecological terms, 30 years is nothing. Right. I mean, when I think about some of the work I'm doing in other parts of the country where we're same sort of thing, a lot of industrial timber companies are, are moving on. They're doing heavy harvests before they do. But it meets Forest Practices Act. Um, you know, sure, it's, it's fairly denuded now, but that's going to be a forest of landscape in 20 years and will be prime uh, part of the infrastructure portfolio for the utility. So. It's not always easy. It doesn't always pencil out because we often think about more than 20 or 30 years um, as we discount things, but we should, because ecologically that's a blip. Okay, I think, um, actually I want, Suzanne, do you want to ask your question when you slide that in in time? Oh, me? Yep. Oh, so I was just wondering um, in terms of the different re revenue streams in, in an FRB sort of transaction, what is the most important thing? I mean, I I know that the highlight is what you want the contracts with the agencies, whether they're the firefighting agencies or the utilities, but I have a suspicion that it may be the harvest and maybe the carbon revenues that actually are more significant in these transactions. I'm just wondering, I know that there's only been two that have been done, but I'm just wondering in terms of relative importance, what's been um, the most meaningful um, streams in order. Sorry, sorry for the greatest. Um, maybe I'm happy to take a stab. And I know Zach Knight and, and Nick Walbrook are on the line as well, um, who lead, who were the lead developers on this. So um, happy to have them jump in as well. I mean, in the end, it's all all the cash is green, right? So I'm not sure. You almost need sort of that you know, that aggregation of of uh, revenue streams. Um, to, to be at the table. I would say the utility dollars are probably the anchor. Um, that is the core beneficiary downstream 
Um, therefore, it, it often is, is one of the largest proportions of that money. Um, and, and they're most likely the ones who are going to look at not just the first deal in a particular area, but what the second deal within that same watershed looks like. So it's a pilot transaction and how does that then scale up kind of in situ for, for something much larger. What we've seen is um, we were, the first FRB was unique in that uh, the Yuba Water Agency sort of has, wears multiple hats, a water supply agency, you know, they run a, a reservoir which has recreational revenue opportunities and it's also a hydroelectric facility. So in many watersheds, you might see those as three different revenue streams, but in this case, it happened to all be bundled into, into one. The second, at least in the first, first deal that, that came about was a, a variety of, of, of dollars from uh, Cal Fire and other state funds um, from their GHG funding pool, from resiliency dollars, uh, et cetera. Uh, and in aggregate, that was quite meaningful in being able to kind of hit the number we needed uh, to be able to um, entice investors to play and, and be able to, to pay them back. Um, carbon credits is a it's an interesting one. Right now, the rules do not allow for carbon credits to be generated on public lands because there's a belief that it would undercut private lands. These things are already subsidized by our tax, which I, I can totally understand. We'll see in the years to come um, if, if that still is um, uh, is the case, especially as these, this fire issue increases. But the last thing is forest service dollars. Uh, and for the first deal, that was mostly in kind uh, on the planning side and, and the um, planning environmental review. As these deals uh, become replicated and, and much larger scale, I believe that, that in kind will need to turn to cash. Um, Last thing I say is in subsequent deals, we are looking for additional private sector beneficiaries, whether it's ski resorts, you know, whitewater rafting, other recreational pieces, beverage industries. And when you think about the supply chains of many of the Fortune 500 companies who are operating these watersheds, I believe they will be at the table too. That's exactly great. Right. And that you wanted to add or? Todd, it's your panel. I'm just, I'm just living in it. That was great, thank you. Well, the idea, so there's, given the three of your organizations, the view that you collectively have over potential solutions, scaling solutions, things that have failed, uh, and I got some questions about even now, what's different given the pandemic. I, can you reflect on that? Like if you look at the things you've seen in your portfolio, maybe even not that didn't make it in, you know, are there patterns that you've seen that we can learn from? in this space. Chris, you were mentioning some that uh, have done okay and some have done, I know earlier before the meeting we were talking about some that haven't done so well and then some that are great. Yeah, I mean, to bang on this again, I do think um, the quality of the people involved and their ability to motivate and inspire others, particularly capital sources and and partnerships, I think is a really big one. Um, you know, I think the supportive community context is is another another one for sure. Um, and then I think uh, you know probably a third one would be just really understanding the end markets that you're trying to uh, to to sell into. And some of these are very well developed end markets where there's a lot of incumbent players that just aren't that focused on restoration, supplying firewood or post and pole or things like that. And so um, that could be a leg up for, for, for some of these things. Some end markets are complicated and, and, and very risky, like bio, you know, small scale bio, bio electricity type things or biofuels. Yeah, I think um, one pattern uh, that I'll talk a little bit about, especially when it comes to some of the newer technologies that we've seen um, in a variety of different areas. I go back to when I spent a lot of time looking at closed containment aquaculture, where you see these technologies that have the potential to, to really um, almost be a silver bullet. And they're so close in so many ways, but you really need everything. You need the management team, you need the technology, you need the operations, you need the capital. And it's so easy for these to get derailed, right? So even if you think, well, this should work, the theory of change is right, the technology is there, but there's something holding them back. Sometimes it's just a small operational issue. If they could just fix that, 
And I think that's the pattern. So you really need all those, uh, all those things to come together in a way for something to be successful um, financially. And the other pattern is when you do get those examples and you see someone's done this and they've done it well and they've made money, you know, that's what really unlocks, right? That either they can expand at that point or new market entrants will come in. And I think that's, that's a pattern that we've seen in, in a variety of areas and, and hoping that it will develop in a positive way here. Hey, I didn't know I was already off mute. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in about exactly what, the, what we just touched on with relationship to, you know, Chris, you said not to bang on this again, but the quality of the person that is leading the initiative, the entrepreneurial spirit, the abilities to succeed within this complex um, work. You know, Dan, I think um, you actually touched on this as well when you were speaking about the ways in which you grant to specific land ownership classes relates to how innovative the opportunity is to be participating, whether it's that TNC insurance program that you mentioned, or it's the FRB for US Forest Service land. So since we've heard a number of people reflect on this, entrepreneurs, leaders, it takes the individuals, I would love to hear if you have perspectives on where and how those ideas that are successful, that are creative, that are pushing the, the envelope and making it work, are sharing their knowledge, sharing their lessons learned, sharing their failures and growths, um, there's been a couple of questions in the chat about whether the what you know what systems were they surrounded by that enabled them to succeed. What could we do to create an environment that produces more of these entrepreneurs? I, I could jump in quickly, and I'll let um, probably Chris talk more about the specific entrepreneurs in terms of uh, for-profit businesses, but. I think one thing that's, um, that's important is a lot of, um, and Todd said this in his introduction, a lot of this isn't rocket science, right? A lot of the science is pretty clear about what will help mitigate catastrophic fires. Um, the practices are known. It's just a question of organizations having the knowledge about how to apply and the resources on how to apply. So there are certain organizations that we partner with where I know if, if forest land is in their hands, it will be well stewarded. It will be managed um, to reduce fire risk. And I don't have to worry about it other than trying to get it into their hands. So how is that shared? And I think that's where we will sometimes um, jump in and help fund things. I think one example I'd use is um, the San and this is a collaboration of not just NGOs like Semper Viren, Redwoods, but also um, timber companies, uh, other big landowners to get together and think about, all right, how do we manage this, um, this area as a landscape rather than our own separate properties and let's share those best practices. So I think that's something that we're, where we can and other funders can continue uh, to play a role um, and then I'll probably kick it to Chris to talk about the entrepreneur focus of your question. Yeah, I, you know, I would say I don't, I don't want to go out on a limb and I don't know that I have a necessarily great answer here. I think um, it, it, there's certainly, I would say, you know, I think we could look to the kind of tech world and some of the business school um, competitions and things as ways to su create supportive context for entrepreneurs. I think that's certainly a well-developed thing in, in Silicon Valley, for example. And so, you know, maybe that's part of something that you're thinking about here. I don't have a total familiarity with, with, with some of the initiatives that you mentioned earlier, but um, providing those upfront resources and giving people the uh, running start that they need, I think is, is something that really could unlock a lot of this. I do think that the increased attention to this issue and people's personal experiences with it are just going to pull a lot more people into this over the next few years than have been historically involved and interested in this. I mean, even just the mix of this conversation relative to, you know, like when I go to like timber uh, conferences and investment, timber conferences, you know, it's unusual for there to be anybody other than white men over 55 years old at those things. And so just the quality of people getting into the mix and the diverse perspectives and so forth is a total sea change relative to um, who's been involved in things like production forestry in the past. And that 
has got to be accruing to our benefit as we think of new and creative ways to solve these problems. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, I'm recognizing our time um, and respecting everyone's passion and efforts here. So, you know, we had one question um, that we definitely wanted to sneak in here. And, and to all three of you in whatever order, you know, what's the one thing that you think you need to accelerate this work? from your perspective, from your organization? What's one thing? I'm happy to start. I mean, and, and um, I believe it was Lauren who asked the question about sort of the scale of the current capacity to match the scale of the need. And it goes back to my point of, um, I think private capital has an important role to play, but it's gonna have to follow federal action and federal investment. Um, and it will take a couple of years, right, to, 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 to grease the wheels and get this thing going. Um, so we might as well start yesterday. We need massive investment in jobs in the woods, um, focused on areas of the highest fire risk um, that, that can start to get ahead of this so that there is the capacity to create the supply to generate the market to reduce our risk um and maybe it's wishful thing but it, it it seems like if we if we make the commitment you know with a huge federal investment um and maybe this maybe if there's a new administration that will that will happen uh we can get ahead of this um the alternative is is more of the same so that, that's what I think is, is needed. And without that, everything else is window dressing. I'd say from my perspective, I think that the more companies and more private enterprises that are out there that one can start to do some of this pattern recognition around, then it becomes a lot easier to invest in, which is to say, if there's only 10 examples of success around the West or five, it's really difficult to decide whether to invest in the one that walks through your door. If there are hundreds and hundreds of companies and this is a well-developed field and people know what the drivers of success or failure are and that sort of a thing, then it becomes much easier to invest in, which means that investor expectations lower because the risk has proportionately been reduced. And so I do think that there is this sort of virtuous cycle. And I think this kind of gets to something Todd talked about earlier, which is that paradoxically, it is easier to raise large amounts of money than to raise small amounts of money because of issues of transactional friction and, and transaction cost. And so I do think that as this industry matures, capital will become easier, even easier and more available to find. I happen to think that there is quite a bit of capital that wants to invest in this. And I see a lot of our peers in the impact investing space seeing this as an issue that they want to invest in. It's just the challenge of there's so few entrepreneurs that have been successful that there's just not the pattern recognition and kind of ability to templatize this to some degree. And so that's a chicken and egg situation to the max. But I do think it is one that as um, this gets ramped up with federal funding and new innovative conservation finance mechanisms and other things that, um, again, you will see that private capital is eager to play in the space and will become easier and easier to work with. That's my, that's a, that's a hope and an aspiration and a need wrapped up in one. <laughs> Great. Well, just following on those two points, I think Todd, uh, talked about the need for more public investment. Um, Chris talked about private uh, commercial or private investors. And I think the, you know, the third leg of the stool, and what I would say is more philanthropic investment. Um, there's been, and the example you, you, you can take from this area, from Silicon Valley, massive amounts of wealth created, a lot of new uh, foundations and philanthropic endeavors set up, but not a lot of funding coming to conservation or forest management, which is, uh, you know, a, a bit disappointing, I think, Obviously, that money is going to other worthy causes, but I think the hope is as people recognize, well, it's hard not to recognize when you go outside and it's hard to breathe, um, as people recognize the need that more of that money, because that's the most flexible kind of capital that you can have, right? Philanthropic grant dollars. And that's in often time, that in many cases, that's what's needed to unlock the public capital and the private capital. So I hope we see more of these uh, newly printed, uh, minted billionaires um, invest some of their philanthropy in this issue. Excellent, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you all, that was um, 
I mean, so for me, the, the bottom line is we got to secure supply, certainly uh, the supply issue of the forest, but also supply of the ideas and the entrepreneurs, which is something I think this group is pretty well tuned to do here in our region and especially now. So I'm excited about that. And I think we can take on that, that second one if we can figure out that first one. To you. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Um, Dan, Todd, Chris, thank you each very much. There is a lively discussion taking place in the chat about what the problem is. What is, what is the moment? What is the pinch point in the value chain? And I think one of the things that is clear to me from today's discussion is that there are several pinch points to your slide, Dan, originally um, along the value chain as we look at what it is that enables restoration. And each of you are focusing on different moments along that value chain. If not now, is there ever a time when the urgency and the drive to increase philanthropic or investment capital in this space could be greater? And if so, I can't fathom what it would take <laughs> than what we are seeing. Thank each of you very much for being here, for sharing the perspectives and the portfolio and the insights that you have. Um, and thank you to the rest of you for the robust and engaged discussion. Stacey, do you wanna share with us the, the next one coming up and then we can close out? Sure, um, that was just riveting. Thank you so much um, for the wonderful presentation and conversation. I feel like um, there's just always so much more to unpack um, to this work. So um, we have three more planned for the rest of the year. Um, and you can see uh, on your screen what we're focused on and they are sure to be really engaging and really important conversations. Um, so we hope that you will join us for that. Uh, Tamia has put a um, uh, survey in the chat for you to complete to give us some feedback um, on how you felt like your afternoon's time was spent with us. Uh, some of you keep coming back so that tells me that you're getting some value out of these conversations. To our speakers, we would love to continue to see you. Um, you add so much to this conversation. It was amazing, so thank you. Um, and for those of you who are, are new faces, um, reach out and let us get to know you a little bit better. Um, so yeah, with that, I just want to um, make a plug. That $50,000 gift yesterday put us over the halfway mark for our $200,000 match. So we are now closing in on $70,000 left to um, fulfill that match and had hoped we could do that um, by the end of this year. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic um, rerouted a lot of our fundraising efforts towards emergency response for our community. Um, and we're proud that we've put over a million dollars now into our community based on a pandemic. Um, but the beat goes on in the forest. And so um, we would appreciate a gift of any size um, that is meaningful to you to keep this work and these conversations moving forward. No pressure. Um, people are strained these days as well. So to even ask is, um, is, is hard because I know that a lot of our community members are struggling. So with that, um, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Teal, Robert, you guys kick ass every time. It's a pleasure to work with you guys and to the TTCF team and to the TTCF board. Thank you for working on this mission um, with all of us. It's, it's powerful and we appreciate everything you guys do. So thank you. Now go have that beer <laughs> or wine that we normally would or soda water. Bye y'all, have a great evening, stay safe. Yay, I see all the hands, that's great. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thanks Dan, Todd and Chris.